The soul, in its first beginning, is not something added to the body, but is generated in the body by the polarization of the astral elements. Once the soul is generated, it enters in each incarnation and passes through many bodies, until finally it is perfected. As there are two of the outer, and there is also two of the inner. The two of the inner are spirit and soul. In the translation of the scriptures the word spirit is often used where soul is meant to be. Because only the man created in God's own image is a living soul, that is, a soul that has the spirit super added to it. The clearest understanding may be obtained of the soul by defining it as the divine idea. Before anything can exist outwardly and materially, the idea of it must survive in the divine mind. The soul, therefore, may be understood to be divine and everlasting in its nature. But the soul does not act directly upon matter. It is put forth by the divine mind, but the body is put forth by the sidral or fiery body. As the spirit on the celestial plane is the parent of the soul, so is the fire is on the material plane that creates the body. The soul, being eternal in its nature, passes from one form to another until, it is in its highest stage, it polarizes sufficiently to receive the spirit. It is this way in all organized things. Nothing of an organic nature exists without a soul. It is in the individual person and it perishes if abandoned by the spirit. As already said, at the moment when the soul appears in any inorganic entity, it is by means of the convergence of the magnetic poles of the constituent molecules of that entity. The focusing of these poles gives rise to a circular magnetic current, and an electric combustion is the result. This vital spark is organic life or the soul. This spontaneous combustion or generation is not a new creation, because nothing can be either added to or withdrawn from the universe. It is only a new condition of the one substance. The soul is to the material organ, as the tune is to the musical instrument. The tune subsists in the mind of the composer, God, before the keys or strings of the instrument can give it expression. But unless for this expression it could not become known to the senses. This tune can be played on many instruments, and transferred from one to another. We are then brought to the great facts, of the immortality of the soul, its transmigrations, and the metempsychosis. The process of incarnation, and the method by which the soul takes new forms, are in this way. When two people ally themselves in the flesh and create a child, the moment of impregnation is usually, but not invariably, the moment that attaches a soul to the newly conceived body. Hence, much depends upon the influences of the astral and magnetic planes, and under which impregnation and conception take place. The pregnant woman is the center of a whirl of magnetic forces, and she attracts within her sphere a soul whose previous conduct and dramatic condition correspond either to her own or to the magnetic influences under which she conceives. This soul, if the pregnancy continues and progresses, remains attached to her sphere, but does not enter the embryo until the time of quickening, when it usually takes possession of the body, and continues to inhabit it until the time of delivery. A pregnant woman is swayed not by her own will alone, but as often by the will of the soul newly attached to her sphere, and the opposition and cross-magnetisms of these two wills often find many strange and seemingly unaccountable whims, alternations of character, and longings, on the part of the woman. Sometimes at the moment of impregnation or conception it passes without attracting any soul, and the woman may even carry a false conception for some time, in which cases abortion occurs. There are innumerable accidents that may happen in this regard. Or the soul, that has been attracted to her, may under new influences, be withdrawn from her sphere, and from the embryo that might have been quickened may be consumed away or the soul originally drawn to her orbit may be replaced later by another and so forth. Some clairvoyant women have been conscious of the soul attached to them, and have seen it, at times as a beautiful infant, at times in other shapes. 
Children created by passionate and mutual love are usually the best and healthiest spiritually and physically, because the radical moment is seized by love, when the astral and magnetic influences are strongest and most potent, they attract the strongest and noblest souls. For you to understand even more clearly and fully the origin and nature of the soul, where it comes from, and how it passes from one body to another. You must know that the plane on which the celestials and the creatures touch each other is the astral plane. The substance of all created things is the creator of both body and soul. The soul, as I have said, is formed by polarization of the elements of the astral body, and it is a gradual process, but once it is formed the soul part of the entity is capable of passing from one body to another. Imagine the magnetic forces of innumerable elements directed and focused to one center, and streams of electric power passing along all their convergent poles to that center. Imagine these streams so focused as to create a fire in that central part, a kind of crystallization of magnetic force. This is the soul. This is the sacred fire of Hestia or Vesta, that burns continually. The body and person may fall away and disappear but the soul, once begotten, is immortal until its perverse will extinguishes it. Because the fire of the soul, or central hearth, must be kept alive by the higher air of divine breath, if it is to endure forever. It must converge, not diverge. If it diverges it will be dissipated and die. The end results of the soul progress is unity, the end results of soul degradation is division. Therefore, the soul that ascends higher, tends more and more to be in union with the divine. This is the manner in which to conceive of God as of a vast spiritual body, constituted of many individual elements, but all these elements having one will and therefore being one. This condition of oneness with the divine will and his being constitutes the celestial nirvana. Listen again, to conceive of the degraded soul is as dividing more and more until at length it is scattered into many pieces and ceases to be an individual being, as it was split and broken up and dispersed into many pieces. This is the nirvana of the Amen, or annihilation of the individual person. And where you inquire, is the supply of new souls for the continual increase of the world's population? Souls, as you know, work up from animals and plants, because it is in the lowest forms of organic life that the soul is first engendered. Formerly the way of escape for human souls was more open and the path clearer because although ignorance of intellectual things abounded among the poorest sort, yet the knowledge of divine things and the light of faith were stronger and purer. Where the souls of those ages of the world, were not being chained to earth as they are now, they were enabled to pass more quickly through their avatars, and only a few incarnations sufficed where now many more incarnations are necessary. Because in these days the ignorance of the mind is weighted down by materialism instead of being enlightened by faith. It has sunk to earth by love of the body and by atheism, and excessive care for the things of the senses faith in God being crushed by it. It lingers long in the atmosphere of earth, seeking many fresh lodgments and so multiplies bodies. Furthermore, you must not learn about creation or the putting forth of things as an act once accomplished and then ended, we must keep the desire to learn and to know alive. Because the celestial Olympus is continually creating and continually becoming. God never ceases giving to and caring for God's creatures. This is also the mystery of the divine incarnation and sacrifice. The celestial substance is continually individualizing itself, so that it may build itself up into one perfect individual. Then the circle of life is accomplished, and its ends meet the one with the other. You have asked me, if the planet consists of body, parasol, soul, and spirit how can there be born of it entities that are not like it, fourfold, but threefold or even twofold, as are minerals and severed parts of bodies, things made by art, and the like. I answer you that your error lies in looking on the planet as a thing apart from its offspring. Certainly, the planet is fourfold, 
and certainly also its offspring is fourfold. But of its offspring some lie in the astral region only and are twofold, and some in the watery region and are only threefold, and some lie in the human region and are fourfold. The body and parasol are the metallic and gaseous envelope of the planet. The organic region composes its soul and the human region its spirit or divine part. Because when it was only metallic, it had no soul. When it was only organic, it had no spirit. But when man was made in the image of God, then it was the spirit of God that breathed its soul into him. Now, the metals have no soul, therefore they are not individuals. And not being individuals, they cannot transmigrate. But the plants and animals have souls. They are individuals, and do transmigrate and a soul that progresses. Man also has a spirit, as long as he is man, that is, he is truly human, he cannot redescend into the body of an animal, or into any creature in the sphere beneath him, since that would be an indignity to the spirit. But if he loses his spirit and becomes an animal again, he may descend, yes, he may become altogether gross and horrible, and a creeping and detestable thing, begotten of filth and corruption. This is the end of persistently evil men. Because God is not the God of creeping things, but Baalzebub is their God. And there were none of these in the age of gold, neither will there be any when the earth is fully purged. O men! Your exceeding wickedness is the creator of your evil beasts, yes, your filthy torments are your own sons and abominable ancestors. Remember that there is only one substance consisting of the human body, sidral body, soul, and spirit, all these are one in their essence, and the human body, sidereal body and the soul are the result of a difference in polarization. The spirit is God's himself. When the gods put forth the world, they put forth substance with its three potentialities, but all three in the condition of odic energy light force. I have called the substantial light sometimes the sidral body, and sometimes the parasol, because it is both. Because it is that which makes and that which becomes. It is fire or the human spirit, out of which and by which earth and water are generated. It is the fiery manifestation of the soul, and the magnetic factor of the body. It is space, it is substance, and it is the foundation so that from it proceeds the gases and the minerals are soulless, and are also the organic world, that has a soul, except for man, it could not make with a soul, because man is fourfold, and of the divine ether or upper air, that is the province of Zeus, father of gods and men. The outer envelope of the macrocosm and microcosm alike, that is represented by the goddess Demeter, and is in reality is not elemental at all, but is a compound of the other three elements. Her fertility is due to the water, and her transmuting or chemical power is due to the fire. This water is the soul or protoplasma, that is put forth by deity and constitutes the individual. Nor are you to look on fire as a true element. Because fire is to the body what spirit is to the soul. As the soul is without the divine life until quickened by the spirit, so the body or matter is without physical life in the absence of fire. No matter is really dead matter, because the fire element is in all matter. But matter would be dead, that is, would cease to exist as matter if motion were suspended, that is, if there were no fire. Because wherever there is motion there is heat, and consequently fire, and motion is the condition of matter, so without fire there would be no matter. The soul is not astral fluid, but is manifest by means of the astral fluid, because the soul itself is like the idea, invisible and intangible. You will see the meaning best by following out the genesis of any particular action. The stroke of the pen on paper is the phenomenon, that is the outer body. The action that produces the stroke is the astral body, and though it is physical it is not a thing, only a transition or medium between the result, the stroke and its cause, the idea. The idea manifested in the act is not physical only mental and is the soul in action. But even this is not the first cause. 
because the idea is put forth by the will this is the spirit. So you will an idea as God wills the macrocosm. The real body or immediate result is the astral body, while the phenomenal body or ultimate form is the effect of motion and heat. If you could stop motion, you would have as the result, fire, and thereby would convert Demeter into Hephaestus. But fire itself is also a material, since it is visible to the outer senses, as is the earth body is. But it has many degrees of subtlety. He therefore, astral or odic substance, is not the soul itself, but is the medium or manifestor of the soul, as the act is of the idea. If, however, the phrase misleads you, it is better to modify it, as thus, the act is the condition of the idea, in the same way as fire or incandescence is the condition of any given object. Light is of spirit and heat is of matter. Water is the result of the operation of wisdom, the mother, or oxygen, and justice the father, or hydrogen. Air is the result of the mixture, not the combination of wisdom and force. Wisdom and force are properly called elements. They are soul and spirit. But earth, properly speaking, is not an element at all. Earth is the result of the water and the fire, and her rocks and strata are either watery or lava. She is water and air fused and crystallized. Fire also, the real maker of the body, it is a mode and condition, and not a true element. See then that the only real and true and permanent elements are air and water, spirit and soul, will and idea, divine and substantial, father and mother, and out of these all the elements of earth are made by the aid of the condition of matter, that is interchangeably beat and in motion. Wisdom, justice, and force, or oxygen, hydrogen, and azoth, are the three out of which the two true elements are produced. But water is a combination, and air is a mixture. Wherefore the only two real entities, water and air, and are unreal to the phenomenal, while the unreal elements, earth and fire or body and electric fluid, are real in the phenomenal. Souls are reincarnated hundreds and thousands of times, but not the person, because the body perishes. These things were known to the Gnostics, Terapauta, Essenes, and to Jesus. This doctrine is embodied in the parable of the talents, as this explains, into the soul of the individual is breathed the Spirit of God, divine, pure, and without blemish. It is God in man's soul. And, in his earth life, the individual has to nourish that spirit, and feed the spirit as a flame with oil. When you put oil into a lamp, the essence passes into and becomes a flame. So it is with the soul of him who nourishes the spirit. It gradually grows pure, and becomes the spirit of God. By this means the spirit becomes richer in spiritual gifts. But, as in the parable of the talents, where God has given five talents to a man, and when he returns, he expects the man pay back ten or he leaves with nothing and perishes. Meaning, the spiritual gifts that God gives us, he will take back if we do not work and learn more about God and the spiritual world. When a soul has once become regenerated, it returns to the body only by its own free will, and as a redeemer or messenger. Such a one regains in the flesh the memory of his past reincarnations. Regeneration or transmutation may take place in an instant but it is rarely a sudden thing, and it is best that it come gradually, so that the marriage of the spirit is only after a prolonged engagement. The doctrine of counterparts, so familiar to certain classes of spiritualists, is a travesty, due to delusive spirits of the marriage of regeneration. Regeneration does not affect the inner man only. A regenerated person may use his emotions based on the love of the Father to change his outer body in such a way that no wounds will cause death. When a person dies, a portion of the soul remains unconsumed, or untransmuted into spirit. The soul is fluid, and between it and vapor is this analogy. When there is a large quantity of vapor in a small space it becomes condensed and is thick and gross. But when a portion is removed, 
the rest becomes refined, and is rarer and purer. So it is with the soul. By the transmutation of a portion of its material, the rest becomes finer, rarer, and purer, and continues to do so much more and more until, after many reincarnations made good use of, the whole of the soul is absorbed into the divine spirit, and becomes one with God, making God so much the richer for the usury. This is the celestial nirvana. So, though becoming pure spirit, or a god, the individual retains his individuality, so that instead of all being merged in the one, the one becomes many. In this way God has become millions. We, too, are legion, and therein resemble God. God is multitudes and nations, and kingdoms, and tongues, and the sound of God is as the sound of many waters. I see God under two modes, one static or passive, and the other dynamic or active. As the static, God is original life and will power. As the dynamic, God is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the substance of God are one. At first there is perfect rest. Then comes a movement of rotation around itself, and substance becomes first ether, and at length matter. Every ultimate particle of matter moves in ether, as do the planets and they have two poles that is in the intercellular ether. Their rotation is intensely rapid, it makes me giddy to look at, and by this movement comes creation. This is accomplished in six periods, and then there is rest, and the whole is reabsorbed. Wherefore there is an incessant putting forth for six days, and a recurring Sabbath of rest. The more rapid the movement of the particles of his body, the more material the man is. Therefore the object of the saint is to attain perfect rest, and thereby union with the Divine One. The philosopher's stone signifies in one aspect perfect quiescence, which means perfect rest, or the reabsorption of matter into spirit through the absence of motion. Then the rigidity that we know as matter is caused by the incessant intense movement of spirit. This truth, for the Greeks, is represented by Demeter, who is all that is in motion and solid. And whereas motion is created by the Holy Spirit, in time her parents are Rhea and Saturn. Rhea is the mother of the gods, and is the same as Nox, the original darkness or invisible light of divinity prior to the manifestation of creation. And Persephone or Proserpine is the daughter of Demeter or motion or that which makes visible by ether. Persephone is the liquid or psychic part of man, that consists of both, his true soul and his fiery or magnetic parasol. The story of the stealing of Persephone, or rape of Proserpine, relates to the fixing of the volatile, whereby the astral part becomes coagulated into the material. Then, belonging half to the body or the lower world, and half to the heavens and the upper world, and then linking the two together, she is said to spend six months of the year in Hades and six months on Olympus. Then she would be drawn up altogether to Olympus, but this is the consequence of her eating a pomegranate, which, like the apple of Eve, is the symbol of illusion or matter, she is fixed in the lower world or body, where her mother, Demeter seeks to withdraw her from. You have to understand that this descent of Persephone into Hades comes about not only through the continued motion of the particles of the soul, but also through their depolarization from the central and divine will. The body should be in such a state that the man can draw in and reabsorb the particles of the soul. But Persephone, through following her own will, reversed the poles of her constituent substance and caused this to become fixed. Whenever the man is in union with the central will of his system, he has power to draw in and reabsorb his body, as was the case with Jesus. And one of the purposes of the gospel story of the water being changed into wine, was to symbolize this transmutation. Animals never have this power, as they have no divine spirit, and therefore, no central will to polarize. Man only has it by the spirit's descent into him. The eating of the pomegranate implies the reversal of the poles, and the illusion whereby the outer becomes the inner, and the individual person oil arises outwardly instead of internally and becomes fixed and material, 
whereby he becomes more animalistic in character and personality, then he loses his soul, and eventually loses his eternal life.